Balber has a, a Balber Singh company that fuses uh, Western and Indian classical uh, forms of dancing. And uh, Kali Chandra Sagaram, who is uh, a, a trained uh, dancer both in Katak and uh, contemporary dance. Um, and Adam Strickson, uh, who is based here in Leeds at the School of Performance and Cultural Ind Industries. And they've been working together, I think for some time now, but they've been working together on a project called Unmasking Pain. So I think what we're going to watch and then discuss is from that, that project. So um, I'll hand over to Balbin, who's going to introduce us to the project. Uh, then we're going to have the performance, and then Adam is going to take over uh, and do some uh, presentations. So we will aim to finish uh, to five minutes to two. Uh, <laughs> and then we're going to move on to our next, next speaker. Great. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody in the room and online as well. It's lovely to be here. Balbi Singh Dance Company was a associate company in residence with the University of Leeds at PCI under Dr. Sita Popap a few years back. So it's nice to be back here again and worked with Adam for a, a many years as such. So I'm just going to speak very briefly to give context to what this project is about and how it feeds into storytelling and sensory storytelling in different ways. So Unmasking Pain is a project to do with chronic pain, people with chronic pain. And the starting point for this was people with chronic pain struggle to tell their story of their pain, to understand and tell that story. And also that story, when they do articulate it, is not necessarily heard or falls on deaf ears or is articulated in a way that is not understood. So this project was a creative approach to help people tune into their bodies to understand themselves in a different way and work with different vocabularies to find the most appropriate vocabulary to be able to experience and understand and tell their story as such. So the vocabularies were quite wide and varied. And so it's about unmasking pain conceptually in one sense, but also in, in, in the literal and, and revealing as such quick PowerPoint. So defining the concept, it's got many strands and layers to it as such, and we're still making sense of it. It's very much a pilot Arts Council funded project with many partners on board. And the important thing within this in terms of stories is not just the telling, but our role as artists to listen and listen in an effective, positive way to allow that story to be heard in, in, in the most appropriate manner, but also provide the tools and the different creative vocabularies to process, make sense, and understand what that story might be. So the partners and collaborators, as I said, number of strands to it. It was an idea that came about through working with my designer and, and, and person that does all my branding, David Andrassi, the first image, as in conversation. For many years, he said, you need to meet this Dr. Francis Cole, who's a pioneer pain specialist. And so he was the matchmaker. And through that, then we worked, we were introduced to Dr. Francis Cole, and then through her to Durham University, uh, their biomedical side, and then working with my staff and, and space too, we began to have conversations and open up new possibilities. And then introductions were made to the Leeds Becker University School of Health, uh, and also Louise Trewern, who is based in, in Devon, who is further on her journey of telling her story about her chronic pain. And part of it was what happens once that story is told? What are the new stories to tell? Or what are the new experiences you have of your body in different ways? <clears throat> So I, I pulled together the team of artists, very varied, male, female, different styles of dance. Uh, we had musicians in the mix, a visual artist, and, and Adam was one of the first artists I brought on board. So Adam, please, it would be brilliant to bring your expertise into this project. So spread across the country, uh, Leeds School of Health, Durham, University, Devon, there where Louise is based, uh, London, Rosie, Crookshank, uh, St. Thomas and Guy's Trust Hospital, physio there with a the dance training previously, uh, and working with an Arabic refugee group in Huddersfield as well. So very broad, working with different groups in Durham over a number of sessions in Huddersfield and also individual pairings as such. So this, I'm not going to say really much about Adam's work in Durham because he will talk in much more detail, but this illustrates or captures some elements of it with the group as well. The one point to make, so it's about we're an arts organization and it's art, health, 
but not necessarily in a medical model. The elements of what we do, which is not artistic or creative as such, in terms of some of the things we draw upon are outdoor walks, fishing, uh, as an activity or connecting with nature in a different way. Hopscotch, which is a childhood game. So just to give light touch emphasis that this isn't necessarily something which is neatly placed as art, art health in a, arts in a health model as such. There's more complexity to it, complexity to it than that. And it's about people understanding, relating, making sense of themselves with new vocabularies for us to facilitate and give them different ways of understanding, processing and, and making sense of who they are with and without the pain. For some people, it was very much a case of don't see me for my condition, see me for me. So there was that approach as well, rather than a particular focus on pain. And ultimately, it's about people being human and creative and making sense of their senses to, to the maximum as such. And so it's a very holistic, complex project, which has, with Durham University, a whole science element to it with Fitbits and monitoring and digital thermal camera imaging in terms of the science data. But there's also the anecdotal and the empathic um, aspect to it. And ultimately, it's about people being able to articulate, understand, tell their stories in different ways. Ways. And as arts organizations, we help stories come to life. To conclude, important to listen. And so here, here's Carly with one of the participants that uh, is an in inspirational Hillary in herself, and Adam will talk in more detail. So that's as much as I'm going to say. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Carly now to explain a little bit about the storytelling aspect of Indian dance as a vocabulary. Uh, Indian classical dance is quite similar to sign language because we use a lot of hand gestures when we tell a story. We don't use, we don't use our voice as such. Uh, we don't speak uh, whatever we're telling when we're telling the story. It's all mime and with hand gestures. So we tell the stories quite direct with our physicality, using our emotions and our eyes and a lot of makeup and costumes. So, uh, and the whole idea is to get a response from the audience, and we call it like, it's, it's called rasa in Indian Sanskrit language, which is the flavor of what you see and what you feel from what we are telling you. So we, the, the main objective for a male, for an Indian classical dancer is to get the flavor from each and every one of you. So in this piece, which I have <coughs> started to create uh, while in this amazing project Unmasking Spain with Balbir Singh Dance Company is um, uh, a journey from where, um, because Indian classical dancers inevitably suffer from various kinds of chronic pain because our, of our training. We do impossible positions like this, like the ballet dancers, and we bend our knees most of the time. So it hurts the knees, the, the ankle, the back, and everything and we mask it with beautiful costumes <laughs> and makeup and a beautiful smile and everything else. So, so, so uh, to articulate, to understand this pain better, um, I've used a different um, approach to, uh, to the pain I'm having. So uh, today we're going to use two different senses, the sight and the touch. So uh, through the frames, we're going to, you, I'm going to kind of guide you to focus to different parts of my body. And then I've got different kinds of balls here to make you kind of un, uh, understand or feel the kind of pain I'm going through, through this piece. So, and also sound from Adam with his beautiful flute.
Hello. So we're going to talk about one day in Durham where we did something very much like that as part of it, which I will also talk about. From Katak to Tubola, one day releasing stories of pain. Now you've seen the balls already there. They're very textural. They inspire a sensory feeling. Carly sometimes rolls them up and down his back and things in relation to pain, and you've seen the different kinds of things that he's do there. You can see that there's Play-Doh there as well and um, juggling balls. So this is the basics of the workshop. The location is the University of Durham, and it's in the business school. It's in a conference room with comfy chairs and low tables, plenty of carpeted space, paintings on the walls, balloons, and access to a large outdoor area. All this is important. The duration of the workshop, about four and a half hours, with a 45-minute lunch break. The equipment, or some of the equipment, freshly picked flowers, things to play with, including light juggling balls, large elastics, hopscotch tiles, spiky shapes, flutes, paper, pastels, phones, cameras, including a thermal image camera, notebooks and refreshments. There are 10 participants with Parkinson's, but they also have other conditions as well, causing long-term pain. And indeed, some of the artists have long-term pain, as you've seen there as well. Two scientist researchers, four artist facilitators, three dancers, and myself as a visual artist. I'm not really a musician, but we didn't have a musician for that day, so I was then, so we worked nicely together. A photographer and a website designer. So that's just a feeling of the space there with chairs, balloons, and paintings, and things like that. It's quite a nice, bright, clean space. So how do I write about it? How do I capture a day of interactive arts activities and reflect on them as if we are experiencing them in the present time? This is Dorothy Hethcote in 1980. I have struggled to perfect techniques which allow my classes opportunities to stumble upon authenticity in their work and to be able both to experience and reflect upon their experience at the same time, simultaneously to understand their journey while being both the cause and the medium of the work. And this is kind of the problem, how to understand the journey whilst you're inside the journey. And another companion quote, consciousness co-arises with sensory activity. It does not exist prior to or independently of its environment, but is called into being conditioned by that which in turn becomes its object. It is always consciousness of something. So, I'm... I'll just take you back to that there. I'm describing session three, perhaps of six. And the participants are from the Northeast, and most have been meeting as a group for a few years, facilitated by Paul, the medical researcher from the University of Durham, who was part of the team. Some of the participants know each other well. I'd observed the first thinly attended workshop, which was a spoken introduction to the project, a demonstration of music and katak dance, allowing participants to react and reflect on what they'd experienced, and some getting to know chat. In the second workshop, where I was not present, there were 12 participants who were reticent about talking about their own pain. A hopscotch board of coloured tiles was introduced as a way of exploring scales, measures and stages in the journey of managing pain. And a visual artist created three face masks for the dancers for their improvised performance, allowing the beginnings of an exploration of colour in relation to emotion. Initial notes for the su suggest session three suggested that we might further explore the hopscotch board, experiment with different colours of Play-Doh because of the different dexterities of the participants, explore colour further, especially in the semi-abstract, involve the participants in playful stretching and offer a performance by Kali. As is the case for most of the workshops of the project, there are ingredients in mind and the notion of an order. The idea is to be open and to collaborate together, seeing what emerges, as Balbir put in an email to me. It's all about new vocabularies and forms of expression to understand their lived pain experience. Understand it in a different way, articulate it, and more effectively manage their condition. The project, as well as each session, is a pilot, an experiment with no set method. We talk in person and on email to plan, and this is done mainly through Balbir as lead artist on the project rather than through group discussion. In colloquial artist language, session three in Durham worked exceptionally well. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll try and work out what this means and why we thought it a success, with something of a phenomenological approach drawn from David Abrams' work on perception and language in the more than human world. 
The approach within the workshop is one of reconnection to each other, to materials, to the experience of pain, to color, to texture, to music, to our blood and breath, to the sound of our voices, to the movement of our bodies, to the vibrancy of the moment, where we are both doing everything and watching everything. Moving, as Abram suggests, like the Cayucan people of North Alaska do, in a forest of eyes, our surroundings aware, sensate, personified, when to touch is to feel oneself being to touch, to see is to feel oneself seen. To use Merleau-Ponty's language, the sensible beckons us, sets problems for our body to solve, even thinks itself in us. If phenomenological language seems mystical, it is because it offers us a refreshed relationship to the world. If everything in our lived world is, as Abrams posits, an animate presence, then a close description of the animate articulating things as we spontaneously experience them is the dynamic expression of reciprocal experience. To repeat Joanna Macy's perception from the words on the slide, consciousness co-arises with sensory activity. This is the condition, the way of operating that Balbir's approach is attempting. And if this is the case, then it is by its very nature improvisatory, spontaneous, and most of the useful thinking happens in the act of doing. I have divided the workshop into seven parts, and the first is the welcome. It is a mild summer's day. As the participants arrive in the room, the doors are open to the outside. A flautist is playing lively folk tunes. A dancer greets each person and gives them fresh flowers. Drinks and biscuits are available, and a string of balloons arises from a chair. This welcome did not happen in the two workshops before, and that's important. I think it's very important, and we discussed it and made it an important part of the workshop. It's a gentle crossing from the everyday to the sacred space, the charged space where something will happen which will be out of the ordinary. It's also a happy entrance, though the project is about experiencing pain and how we manage it in our lives. In this first encounter, as Caroline Tisdall paraphrases Joseph Boys, we are already participating in transforming and reshaping the conditions, the thinking and the structures that shape and condition our lives. This is not how participants enter a room in everyday life. We are asking them not to think about pain. This is a prelude to play. This is followed by what I've called warming in, warming out. We make a continuous audio recording of each session, as well as a continuous series of photographs that tell the sensory story of the activities from moment to moment. When I listen back to the audio, I find that a couple of the participants are trying out juggling right at the beginning using these balls. This is because we've, without any introduction, we've put the juggling balls and Play-Doh on the tables when they sit down. So after they enter and have the flowers and pick up the cups of tea, they begin playing without thinking about of it. And they're already involved in dexterous, sensual, physical, playful activity that's not guided. It's simply there by the objects being there. And as well as juggling, one of the participants mentions two bola, or in Jordi, two bola. So this is a childhood game, which some of you may be familiar with it in different cultures. It's a played against a wall involving juggling two balls and chanting a rhyme, like each peach, pear, plum, I spy Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb in the wood. I spy Robin Hood. Robin Hood in the cell. I spy William Tell. William Tell at the table. I spy Betty Grable. Betty Grable is a star, S-T-A-R. <laughs> Taste, touch, the kinetic, sight, hearing, and even smell with the Play-Doh and the flowers are involved at this stage. It's a full sensory experience. And this immediately leads to storytelling. And this storytelling comes from childhood and reminiscence. But I find out from the audio that it's interrupted by talk about sickness, pain, walking aids, celebrations, relatives, and what being in this group means for the participants. I've called this part of the session warming in, warming out, because it's about the participants and the artists checking in with their own internal worlds through individual, improvisatory, creative activity, and through physical action and talking, sharing emotions with others. The activities are both individual and collaborative, internal and external, and naturally lead to reflection and storytelling. Essentially, the activities are improvisation in the sense that the dancer and teacher Malika Sarko Thomas writes, there is a clear focus on the present as a time in which to simultaneously sense a situation, make decisions, and act. 
Our warming in, warming out can be thought of as a dance improvisation. And it leads to the next part of the workshop, which you've kind of just seen, which is watching a dancer improvise a response to his own pain. Carly, as you've seen, works with pain as part of his life. At Durham, we'd never, ever worked together before on the piece. We were improvising and responding to each other in the moment. The pain is made visible, as you've seen, through Carly's actions from moment to moment. We see the pain on his face, as well as feeling it in the small dance inside ourselves as we watch. It's worth emphasizing this small dance, especially to counter the notion of the passive observer, which my students persist in talking about. Since science has shown that there is no such thing, observers of a dance move inside. The act of watching dance is itself a kinetic act. The understanding of the kinetic, our active perception of balance, is an essential ground for this approach. Carly says the best way to, I relate to pain is to work through movement. That's how I describe things best. So the dance is in itself a phenomenological act. It's a description. His improvisation has a purpose to describe and explore the story of his pain in both life and in the moment of the dance and to invoke an emotional response. One of the observers says, it struck me that the balls were controlling the dance, not the dancer. The dancer was taking his cue from the balls. In other words, the story begins with a sensory impulse and develops this. We then move into stretching whilst the small dance is still alive in the participants and onto group stretching exercises, taking us through to the next stage of the workshop, which is about being in our own bodies. Most of the exercises can be done sitting down or standing. There's no music and little chat. This is a shared activity and nothing's corrected. It's essentially a preparation for play. When children play two baller, they've no need to prepare because of the ready litheness of their bodies. Older adults managing long-term pain need this brief cultivation of body awareness and muscle stretching before they can play. The next thing out of this, we use elastics. We have a variety of elastic loops that can be used around the ankles to larger ones that support full weight, relating to the children's game of elastics, a playground game where children take turns. And again, this is a game with rhymes. There's a different diagram of different kind of things you do, but it's like England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, inside, outside, puppy dogs, tails. And there are many variations of patterns that can be performed. From playing elastics and talking about our own memories, we move on to working with larger, stronger, body-supporting elastics. This, as you can see in the photo, requires trust between facilitators and participants, balancing literally feelings of risk and safety. Eventually, all the participants experience this giving and taking of weight. To analyze what we are doing here within the framework of Abraham's view of sensuous phenomenology, we are allowing bodies to relax into the support of the elastic, taking away to a large extent any sensation of pain, with each participant being immersed in the concentration of the action in the moment. Abraham articulates how Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology brings sense and sensibility together. Sadness, he writes, is indistinguishable from my powers of bodily perception, as my sadness is indistinguishable from a certain heaviness in my bodily limbs, or as my delight is only artificially separable from the widening of my eyes. We sense the narrowed eyes of the concentrating participant in this period, just as we see laughter in much of the photo documentation. And we can't say which comes first, the action of the body or the facial expression, since the incarnation of the feelings seems immediate. While we are playing our versions of elastics, other things are going on, with one participant deciding to explore the hopscotch tiles. And you can see she's still got the balls and the spiky tapes clutched in her hands, still exploring reactions to Carly's dance, while others are juggling and talking about two baller. And because session two had considered color, the seven colors of the hopscotch tiles and the seven colors of the rainbow, out of the physical activities, a discussion of color emerges. And one of the participants, Hilary, in a completely unplanned and valuable intervention, talks about a poem she's written in response to session two, which is called Rainbow. It's an exploration of the emotions caused by pain expressed through the seven colors of the rainbow. And here is an extract where purple is emphasized as the color of her pain. Purple is my hurt. Purple wants to curl up small and weep. Yellow is happy sunshine, the good times, progress, achievement, the feeling of getting somewhere. But yellow is always followed by purple, which is always there, always hurting. She describes purple looking at the other colors of the rainbow as purple pain, bewildered, hurting still, forever hurting. 
Though this intervention was unplanned, it led perfectly to the visual exploration of pain that followed. Just as Hillary expresses pain through colour in her writing, in talking about his improvised dance, Carly described the colour of the balls and the different stimulations for him. Red is quite intense, yellow more peaceful, and these are different aspects of his pain journey. And in the last part of the session, we move to an explicit exploration of pain using shape and colour. Plenty. <laughs> the task is to draw our dominant emotions about pain individually. They're working in pairs for mutual support and advice, using coloured pastels to make marks in and around a large oval face-shaped outline on large pieces of sugar paper. The scale of the paper and the timing is not ex accidental. In a fairly short time, around 15 minutes, the participants are asked to fill the shape and just do it without prior discussion or questions. I asked them to think about three dominant emotions in relation to their pain. I asked them to give one emotion a colour, one a shape, and one a kind of line, like a zigzag or a wobbly line. For a demonstration, I take three emotions suggested by one of the participants and mark the paper dynamically for around three minutes. This is not to show the participants what to do, but to embody an attitude and an approach to the task, one that escapes discussion in chairs and takes us directly into the sensuousness of colour and mark-making. The mark-making I do is semi-abstract without any recognisable eyes, nose or mouth, and again, this is deliberate. I am hoping for expressions of emotion that will spill across the outlines of the oval shape. I'm hoping for discovery through action in the moment rather than illustrations of prior spoken discussion and reflection. You can see the vigour of the mark making and by extension the story making in the photos. You can see how Hillary, this is um, Hillary here, and that's her mark making asserts her personal agency beyond the expected parameters of the exercise, with a both a responsibility to the moment and in Abraham's phenomenological terms, uses her own sense of freedom to extend beyond the perceptions of the present moment. She can only express her emotions in the fully abstract, using a blank piece of paper and just about keeping her marks within the rectangle. And as you can see, using her dominant pain color of purple, she says there is no edge because pain goes everywhere. We then asked each participant to show their drawing and talk about it, inviting questions. To give an example, if we look at the drawing on the left that's being pointed to by the person that's made it, this is how she described it. Black is the pain coming in like a dark cloud that starts with a headache. It feels like your head is going to explode. The blue lines are because I walk like I'm drunk. And then the brush strokes. The fibromyalgia washes right down. It washes through. The arrows going into my head are like someone stabbing. The pink is my happy place, and underneath there is a smile, because I always smile. <laughs> a sensory story of pain is told in line, shape, colour, and words, vividly alive in the moment, and the other stories are no less vivid. These reflections prepare both artists and participants for the last and seventh stage of the workshop experience, which happens after the time together in space. The rest is silence last words of Hamlet, Shakespeare. During the session, after the playful warming in and warming out, Paul, the medical researcher, and Balbia both talked to the participants about the deep silence experienced after the second workshop because of the massive learning. Tellingly, Balbia says, every time we go away, and he's talking about the artists on the car journeys back home, as will happen today, we'll be silent. There's so much in the deep silence to think about. Carly says this is a kind of letting go, like the dissolving in the river Ganges of the clay images of Ganesh, the elephant god, after the festivals. It's been a very busy day. But as the audio reveals, there is a necessity in following it with a period of silent reflection, with a rest of the mind. This deep silence that is a necessary ending of the sensory story of the day is a result of a deep sharing between participants artists and scientists, both for those who participate actively and for those who observe. And it is only in the deep silence that we can quietly and finally find our own individual stories, whether artist or participant, realizing in William Penn's words, how nourished and refreshed we are in our spirit. Thank you very much.